My first interest in life was magic tricks. I was, you know, just interested in the mystery and the magicalness of everything, and I suppose that was to translate eventually into my interest in hypnosis. Um, one day, I was walking down uh, one of the main streets of Brighton, England, and I went in to see a vaudeville and see a hypnotist at work. And he made people dance with brooms and did silly things, and I thought to myself, this is not just parlor entertainment. There's got to be something behind this. Maybe if people could be made to do silly things, maybe they could be made to do sensible things. That's what I thought when I was 15 years old. And so I looked into it. Um, there wasn't many books on the subject in those days, and it was looked upon as charlatanism. We're talking about, you know, I'm 68 years old now. So. But finally I got the hang of it, and I learned to hypnotize people. Some officers came one night, and um, they wanted, they heard that I could do the, this sort of thing, and it was very entertaining in my barracks. I had everyone cleaning my boots and my, <laughs> and cleaning my rifle for me, and they did more for me than the sergeants, you know. <laughs> I think the sergeant got a little jealous. And um, the officers came one night and said, can you do this? I said, yes, I can. So I hypnotized both the officers, and we'd, nobody did any fire duty that, that night because they were asleep too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point is, that there's more to that <clears throat> than meets the eye. And I found out that the world, the life itself is hypnosis. I actually went to America and there was a, um, a book written called Bridie Murphy. It was all about a um, person who was reincarnated and they found their bones in an Irish cemetery and there was a story that coincided with the person who was supposed to have been re reincarnated connected to the, to the bones and in the graveyard, the story of their life. So it was a big rage, and it was supposed to be a regression under hypnosis. There's no such thing, of course, but uh, that's another story. But there is no such thing as a regression. It's, uh, under hypnosis, a person can fabricate almost anything. The UFO sightings, a lot of it are people stricken by some kind of um, hysterical, uh, hypnotic hysteria that is very prevalent in this day and age. Uh, what I discovered was, though, to cut a long story short, after founding the, Hypno the Institute of Hypnosis in, in Houston, Texas, and I was there for seven years working with all kinds of people with great success, I discovered something frightening, that everybody in the world, with no exception, including yourself as the interviewer, um, everyone, there are no exceptions, right up to the President of the United States, it doesn't make any difference, but I don't care if you're driving Cadillacs or if if you're just working in a store, an ordinary fellow, everyone is under some kind of hypnotic spell. And they do move and have their being not from within themselves, like human beings are supposed to, but they're controlled by their culture, by condition reflex response signals, post-hypnotic suggestion, if you like. So if you're born in Borneo, you'd be a cannibal. If an American was born in Borneo, he'd make a good cannibal. And they have, the cannibals don't have any tolerance for real human beings. They, they are threatened by real human beings. A mama cannibal is proud only of a better cannibal, if she can produce one, you'd see. And so in America, same way, every race and every color and every creed and everything you do from the day you're born comes from the uh, influences of your environment, and the environment keeps you captive. It's almost like post-traumatic stress syndrome. We all live through condition reflex signals. You get up in the morning, you have coffee, and, and everything, the, the, the smells and the sights and the sounds sort of move you. And you move through the day like a drone in such a useless way, in a nine to five syndrome, and life is meaningless, and life is death. But that kind of life leads to death, and we have a lot of people rebelling against it as, as if they could, as if they knew how, but they don't. So you've, we've spent a whole life conforming to the pressures of life and what life expects of us. As several, several psychiatrists and psychologists, well, not several, hundreds, I have on my file who use these techniques today with astounding results. Like, instead of taking 10 years to make a person well, it, like it takes um, a person with a multiple personality disorder can become well in a month and people with other disorders, like a few days. So I have several psychiatrists, Dr. George Hayter is one of them, who has been doing my techniques for the last 15 years with astounding results. So, um, but I uh, ran afoul of the, the law 
at one time. I didn't know it, you see, and so they got me for practicing medicine without a license, but I wasn't practicing medicine. I was practicing, you know, helping people. To, actually, I was teaching them some very spiritual principles, like you should live from yourself, you know. So they sent a man in one day and who had actually been in a patient of a mental hospital, but he was with a, with a, business, a business bureau. And so he said, you know, that he was an alcoholic. And I told him, I said, well, the reason why you're an alcoholic is because you're imitating your father that you hate. And so if you hate your father, who was an alcoholic, you have two grounds for becoming an alcoholic. One, you become what you hate. So you have the conflict your father had. Two, you have the same um, need for alcohol that your father had. So that was called diagnosis. So I wasn't very versed in the law in those days. I was only 32 years old with four kids. And, and so I didn't know how to handle that very well. So they sent me to jail for 19 days. Actually, it was a 30-day sentence, but they couldn't wait to get rid of me because I was hypnotizing everybody in the jail. <laughs> and the headlines read, the headlines read, hypnotist practices spells in cells. <laughs> and there were actually people bribing the, the guards in the, in the jail to, to, they wanted me to treat their, their, their sons. And, and there were actually people in jail, you can look at it in the Houston Post and the Houston Chronicle, um, that there was, there was an inmate saying, I'm glad I went to jail child molesters and people like that, I was helping. So they put me in solitary confinement because when I was in solitary confinement, the, the, um, the, the inmates of the jail, because I, ha I had money, and I, but I didn't want to flaunt it in front of them to get special privileges, they bought me chicken and they, they took care of me in solitary confinement. They appreciated my help so much. And they don't have such services in jail to help people to teach them how to control themselves because when they get out, they go back in the same old circumstances, the same old pressures, and they don't know how to deal with it, and they become influenced again to do bad things, you see. So I, got a, I, I bought a house trailer, cut a long story short, and I headed west to Los Angeles, and um, someone put in touch, me in touch with a radio station, Mr. Al Williams, who's been my very good friend for the last 36 years. I'm still on one of his stations right now. He's a wonderful man, and uh, he wouldn't let me go on. He thought I was too naive for radio. It was religious radio, 15 minutes, but it wasn't very expensive. So he wouldn't let me go on. He didn't want to see me hurt. He was just a good man. But when I went on, I was an instant success. And then he gave me time on radio to do um, a talk show. He said, can you do a talk show? I said, I, I don't know. I'll try. And so that's how I began my talk radio program. And I have a talk radio network right now. I went through a period of time uh, where um, America was sliding into decadence and uh, with the media leading the way. Um, is it John Milton who says, um, when John, Mil John Milton said, um, license they mean to those who cry freedom, see? And so in the, in the early 60s and 70s, when with the liberal media leading the way for the descent of the United States of America, and uh, God forbid, uh, hopefully not the world, um, I was looked at as uh, being a conservative, being, having family values and believing in God. And uh, They were interested in license, and I was made, they thought I was sort of like, well, a conservative right-wing bigot. That's how they saw me. I'm far from right-wing or left-wing. I don't think we should have any wings. It's not a way to fly. <laughs> but. Um, uh, I think we should be somewhere in our center and not be left or right of anything because being left or right of anything is to be left or right of being healthy. We fought two wars against the socialist left and socialist right, fascism and communism. And here we have socialism as our government now. And look at the mess. It's death-centered society. Anything, any, any, any person who holds up license and calls it freedom is, not, is leading you to death and not to life. And then, of course, when, when, you, when you cross the line, when you cross the line of conscience and you buy the argument, so you become promiscuous, so you become homosexual, so you become, you start to drink and, and have a good time and, and drugs and rock and roll and swapping wives and 
in, you know, having abortions. One thing leads to another. You slowly be led from one level to another downwards until, well, it looks like life, but it is really death in disguise of life. The scripture says, um, blessed are those who are reviled and persecuted and men so shall say all manner of false things against you for being right. Because in the middle of all this descent of America, I was standing up and saying, hey guys, you're going wrong. And the media didn't like that. And I accused the media of being a whore. See, as leading the way and, and sort of like being uh, a vulture. So sort of because there's also scripture that says where dead bodies are there do vultures flock. There's a certain kind of parasite human being that lives on the descent of a human race. They lead the way and they feed on your, on your dying. The problem with human beings is that once I, and here's, here's what you need to uh, understand, all of us need to understand, that we have a conscience, that we're not just flesh and blood and brain. We're not just animal all the way through as the socialists would have us believe. You know, live and be merry for tomorrow you die and have enjoy yourself. So what's the point? What's the point of being good? There's nothing more than just this flesh and then death. So why not enjoy yourself? But if you look at the nobleness of our forefathers, if you look at even your own life, yourself, my interviewer, you'd die for your children and your family. And so why would you want to die for something noble? If, if all there is is flesh, why not be selfish and not die for anything? Because there is, you must die for what you believe is right. You must live for what you believe is right, and then, if necessary, die for it, because there's something more to life than just eating, drinking, and defecating, right? So we must realize that. And life without that meaning, that purpose, whatever that purpose is, uh, is meaningless and empty and horrible, and that's the reason why people try to kill the pain of their dying by living it up. But that only leads to their dying. See, because they're denying, because when you cross that border, as I was trying to say, as you have this, everybody has this conscience, this soul, this person within a person that occupies the same space at the same time. And, and we, this soul is supposed to live through the body, but God is supposed to live through the soul. So if we are inclined towards the love of truth and His, his purpose for our, us on this earth, if we're inclined towards that, we could also be inclined towards our own selfishness, our egotism. And so, like we all, most of us have fallen to egotism. And, and that's, there comes the unholy standing in the place of the holy. See? So we all, in a sense, six billion people on earth, all of us in some way or another playing God, denying God. But that's also to deny life and have a life separate from Him. But that life separate from Him is dependent upon excitements and stimulations and what we call generally temptations. See? Excitements. In other words, we had, when we cross that line from, used to be, I used to use this example, West Germany and East Germany. On East Germany used to be totalitarianism. You cross the line from freedom, for whatever reason, and to, from West Germany to East Germany, you come under the influence of a dictatorship and you can't get back. And it's the same thing when when you are persuaded that wrong is right and you're able to foolishly cross the border, tantalizingly you do it, then when you, you cross that line, first, the first stage is hypnotic. The first stage is the appeal to the ego. And when it finds the grounds, where a person finds the grounds to seduce you, it conjoins with that ego and you cross that border and the soul is pulled away from life from the life that depended upon the Creator, but on a life that depends upon temptations and excitements and stimulation. And that's called um, death. We actually die. When you're separated, when you lose faith, when you break the... I'll give you an example. Let's say I said to you, you're my son, don't eat Twinkies today. And, well, I don't have to give you a reason, but we're having a party tonight, and, we, and I, I don't want you to eat all these Twinkies. It's okay tomorrow. And a little boy comes along and says to you, hey, uh, don't listen to your dad. You know, you'd be a man. Why don't you just eat the Twinkies? That's how he became a man. After all, he did that dad. He said, your dad is just testing you. Come, let's do it. So the, the temptation to be our own persons, our ego desire is to be free from 
being subject to what is greater than us. We want, see, therefore, the temptation finds its mark. And you eat your Twinkies. Now, you're separated. You're separated from your father. You're separated in your faith, in your doubting him, see. And now what happens is, if you're not going to admit, if you're not going to say to your dad, Dad, I'm sorry, I ate the Twinkies, you're going to become, you're going to not want to face your father. And you're going to, it's like the prodigal son. You see, now you become dependent on your friend's support for what, so you feel comfortable with yourself. And that's exactly what happens with all of us. We find the wrong kind of friendships and the wrong kind of comforts. And we eat the wrong kinds of foods because subconsciously and biologically too, there's a biological factor, it's called animal magnetism, but we'll talk about that later if you like. There's a, there's a factor when you become wrong, you don't want to admit you're wrong. And, and you find yourself beholden and fascinated and fixated and dependent upon the love of those who've made you wrong. In other words, if a, if a woman has been violated, for example, uh, by uh, her father, her mean father, She's degraded to such a point and corrupted to a point of hating him. But strangely enough, in that corrupted state, she has no tolerance for a good man. If there's a bum within 50 miles, she's attracted to him for support for what her father made her. And so when you cross the line with drugs, for example, and rock and roll, um, your consciousness is altered. Your allegiances are changed. And the enemies of America know that. They know they can corrupt you just once. They can give you solutions to that corruption, which are even further corruption. See? So for instance, if I offer you drugs and you take it, when you come home to your parents, your parents will say, why are your eyes red? You say, shut up, mind your own business. You're no longer friends of your family, but you'll rush out to find comfort in the very people who corrupted you with more drugs. The government is the same way. They, if people who want power don't want you to be true to yourself. They don't want you to be real. They don't want you to be independent. That's why I was always attacked in the 60s. I was talking about independence. Don't rock and roll. Don't take drugs. See, be independent. But that doesn't serve the purpose of the power brokers of America, who don't want you to be independent. They want you to be codependent. Is that making sense to you? So you get, and so this is a slow, so, a slow sl slide into death. See? This is a slide into, this is how all the great civilizations slide slowly into death. When you become wrong, you don't want to admit you're wrong. Now, how is it? If you read the scripture, if you can decode Adam and Eve, you can read all that's wrong with the human race right there because it's transferred from one generation to another. Eve is cast in the role of supporting Adam's fallen ego. The more she loves his ego, the more of an animal he becomes. Therefore, divorce and fighting. He turns into an animal. And he blames her for what, he, what has become through his misuse of her. See? And so the whole human race inherits this kind of death as life, a, a wrong. And, and, and men, in their foolishness, seek the support for their ego. Every man, every man feels a sense of angst, a sense of awkwardness. Every man feels a sense of uh, um, anxiety about his existence but he finds security in the love of a woman. There's not to say that women are not to love and you're not to be loved, but you, don't, shouldn't, be lo if you shouldn't be love made feel secure when there's something wrong with you. And doctors make you feel secure when there's something wrong with you, and religion makes you feel secure, and drug pushers, it's legal or illegal, it doesn't make any difference. We're all seeking to feel secure in our, in our descent into hell and death. But religion has never really should have religion should have been the answer because the whole purpose of religion is to reverse the, the, the descent or the sin but they've also become our comforters you know it seems like we could, it, the, the local bar and the local church is not a whole lot different only the means but the principles the same stroke ego make you feel comfortable you have no fault society there is a right and a wrong and so even in school that they teach you between the two ways, homosexuality or promiscuity, you know. But it's just a choice of, well, if you want to be um, chest, that's one way. And if you want to be promiscuous, it's the choice of two right ways. It's nonsense. There is a right and a wrong and a consequence for the wrong. 
but we have dealing with evil in high places. And we have to be wise enough not, not only to not to fall to it, but the hard part is to come back from, from our denial of death. As it is with people in their dying, in their descent into death, as if it was life. Living it up, you know, in the kingdom of hell, you know, up is down and down is up. It's, everything's reverse. But as it is with people, so it is with nations, collectively. We all do the same thing. And as an individual, I was a standout and therefore ridiculed. And I was on the radio, so they gave me a hard time. But it turns out that I was right. We are descending into death and slavery. There's a slow descent into slavery and dictatorship and death. And as a result is that some of us, some people, are sensible and they're seeing it. And they're not so involved. And therefore, there's a revolution brewing in America. Because those who have power don't want to relinquish it. It's like being married. Once you give your wife the power through being weak with her, you see, and then you stand up and become a man, try to be a man, and she doesn't want to give, she doesn't want to give up what you've given her. She likes the elixir of power. The same with politicians. Politicians. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, I don't have to repeat it, but it fits here well. You know, power corrupts. And if you're not very careful, you've got to be very full of character in order to handle power. You have to be full of character, because if you don't have character, then it will corrupt you. And so, if you look at the scripture, again, if you can look at the, um, the Garden of Eden story, and, and you see the man and woman relationship today, the woman being cast in the role of supporting male ego, and turning him in from a human being into an animal, without realizing that her love is doing that. So you see the compassion of the liberals doing the same thing, supporting everything wrong with everybody, and making everybody who's wrong feel right, and everybody who's right feel wrong about their rightness, you see. That creates a division in the country, and eventually a violence and a revolution, if, if unreasonableness of power continues to be unreasonable as it will. Because it survives on, on confusing us about what right and wrong is, and leading us away from what life is, into what life isn't. Evil is leading the way, and evil is the most subtle of all the creatures of the garden. It still is. It sometimes the, comes in the guise of love and compassion. Hello, dearie, are you Big May and you? <laughs> you know, see what I mean? It comes in the life of friendship and love, and, and, and it finds your base weakness and appeals to it and awakens it and caters to it and enslaves you. And you cannot rebel. You cannot. Anger, only, anger towards the, that which has corrupted you and violated you only involves you with it more. When I was making that um, um, quote about or, the origin of man, the origin of man, he could either come, the human race could have only des descended or come from two apes and evolved. But are we evolving? No, we're devolving. Anybody with any brains, the only thing is evol uh, evolving is this kind of license, this madness, this anarchy, that's evolving. So, but so the freedom from truth is death. And it's hell, a living hell, as you could look at the world around you. You see it on TV all the time, look at the inner city. It's just one living nightmare because they're free from the values that the Judeo-Christian values that we hold so dear. They make fun of us, you see, but they're dying and they're miserable. They're drunk and alcoholics and al drug pushers. They had, their children don't know their fathers, you see. It's a living hell, violence and horror and murder. And these are the people who make fun of people who are decent, who are productive, who have a, a modicum of values. See, so there's a movement towards, no one's perfect, but you move towards perfection, the ideal. Now there are those who move away from it, thinking that it's too harsh and brutal and restrictive, you see. When we cross that border and we're trapped on the other side, then we, sometimes you can't lick them, you join them. And you become, your allegiance is changed. And that which you used to be, that which you might have been mocks you as conscience. And you're very, def the average person is very defensive. So when you become wrong, you, you feel embarrassed around people who are, who used to be like you, your family, you know, your, your the people, your, for instance, if, if you um, are happily married with a nice woman and a nice wife and children and the l lady next door corrupts you, you'll be loyal to the lady next door. She has you in her grasp more so your allegiance towards her pleasure-giving 
is much more than the boring life you once had, see, they, for which you didn't have love. If you had love, you wouldn't have changed sides for sensuous love. It's like a death. And so when you cross that border and you doubt what you know is right and you give way to license, a, a new way of life springs up in you that's dependent upon the reassurances of those who have corrupted you. And that is that death. When once you become wrong, in other words, whatever wrong is, when you, when you step across that border and you become wrong, then you don't want to, you deny that you are wrong. And in the scripture, it, um, the, 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 the knowledge of the fruit, of the Twinkie tree, what I was talking about, the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that was the point of disobedience, where you doubt what's right and you believe the serpent, a license is freedom, freedom is license, or you love the truth, or you're freed from the truth to be your own person, but you're not your own person. You're addicted to all, you're dependent. This life is dependent on what has seduced you from it, and therefore, without realizing it, you've become a slave, and you're descending, because the more you descend, the more guilty you become, the more guilty you become, the more excitements you need, the more pleasures you need to escape into it, to deny the truth that you're dying. And if you remember the, the sentence of death, to Adam, you shall, eat it, you shall surely die. Well, this is everything that human race feels when they're guilty. It, a sentence of death follows them, S uh, spiritually, psychologically. They feel a doom, a bore. They call it boredom. It's like a death. And if we're not doing something exciting, something wrong, something pseudo life-giving, we feel like we feel depressed and. There's only so much pleasure and excitement you can afford, and then it catches up with you again. It becomes a morbid condition where the, your conscience follows you as a sentence of death. And your denial of death has brought this about. And all the pleasures, you, all the pleasurable things you do, and all the wrong decisions you make, and all the wrong friends you heap up to yourself, you see, this is productive of, the, of death. So the life that we live leads to death. There's a life that leads to life, and there's a life that leads to death. But the point is, people are afraid of death because we, in our egotism, part of that descent has something to do with wanting to be a god or being a mortal, thinking that we are not just a miserable worm living a short life and being eaten by worms, you see, at the grave. We like to think of ourselves as gods living forever. We live, young people think they're going to live forever. And then they spend their life in the wrong way like the prodigal son and when you get to past 30 it begins to dawn that you've kind of wasted your substance and that but that time you're lost and then you need religion or you need drugs or something you need and then medicine comes to the rescue trying to keep you alive who wants to live with tubes in your ears and 50 pills a day and what kind of life is it a healthy plant is a healthy plant you can keep it alive by spraying, but what use is a plant that you have to keep alive by spraying? It has no futility, no value, not even to itself, right? So there is a life that leads to death, and 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 there are people who prey on the dying and lead. There's a there's a parasitical type of human being who sociopathic, psychopathic kind of people, and they usually emerge as leaders. Look at the world, the whole human race has a history of enslavement. But if you look at your own life, uh, this society is descending into slavery. Each one of us are addicted to something. But, but it helps to comfort us and justify, well, this is the way I am. I smoke because I choose to. Now, what this real person is really saying is, I'm not really free. I'm a slave of my cigarette, my drug, whatever it is. But it's something I choose to do. It's me. What he's doing is making a compulsion look like a free will choice, therefore he doesn't have to see he's a slave. So all of us who are slaves and living up in our pleasure, uh, where our pleasures are serving us, are really enslaving us, but we don't see that. We don't want to see this enslavement part. We don't want to see the, that, that, that this life that we're living is only an ego life, and an ego life leads to death, and to all kinds of diseases and complications, a nightmarish existence. And you see, if you look at society, you see different various stages of that. The horrible things that people do to each other. The horrible things that people do to each other themselves. And as they get towards the end of this life that leads to death and there's no more 
they can't deal with their conscience anymore and the pain is so severe, then you've got Dr. Kevorkian to help you, the angel of death, to help you die with dignity. You see? <laughs> and what kind of dignity is that? We're calling this miserable death a person who can't stand his living any longer, who's fed up with life, who thinks life is a punishment. He thinks that death is a safe relief, and it isn't. Because there may be something on the other side. And he, everyone who has suicidal thoughts has a voice telling them, you know, you deserve better than that. You really don't. <laughs> but, you see, why don't you kill yourself and get it over with? That's the voice that talks to us as you descend into the depths. You keep denying and denying and denying, and you go deeper and deeper into your flesh. And you almost can hear the other side talking to you. Uh, it becomes your voice of conscience, but always leading you to the other side. You know, life is like a bridge, a rope bridge between dim two dimensions, and our life is to move to one side or the other, to right or to wrong, to, to truth or to denying it. And when that rope bridge breaks down and you die, you find yourself on one side or the other of the chasm. All the doctors in the world will not save you. All the religion in the world will not save you because all you need is, to, is the secret of being restored to the original state from which Adam fell. He had a choice between right and wrong, but we don't have that choice. And, um, but we have something better than that. Our choice is better than that. It's not really a choice. It's a salvation from a choice. This is the basis of Christianity, by the way. I'm Jewish. I understand one of our guys made it, you know. <laughs> I, I'm a Jewish person that believes that Christ was the Messiah, but I'm still Jewish. Why, can't I, why do I want to believe in a, a bearded rabbi who obviously only learned what he read? I, like, I believe in a person who intuitively knows. I'm a man who knows things by intuition. I, I can know the scripture, not by bragging. It sounds like I'm bragging, I know, but we can all know it. In a lightning flash, um, a porpoise is a porpoise is a porpoise, and a great white shark is a great white shark. Um, they both have their natures, and they're true to their natures. They have no choice. Um, I can leave my old nature behind if I'm not happy with it. Some people are happy with the nature they inherit. But man is born of nature, then of spirit. Adam was created differently, and he has this choice between ego, playing God, and loving God. See, that was the, the separation. So. And, 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 and that inheritance comes down to us because Eve was the f mother of all living. She was the mother of the first ego, Adam, right? And she had to mother it. it doesn't, don't women have to mother egos? And therefore, there was no father. In, in effect, the relationship between Adam, the first man, and his creator was gone. He was already subject to the forces in his wife. She needs saving. Women, women need saving by the love of man. But now a woman is cast in the, in the miserable role of supporting the, the animal ego of a man. And the more she loves him, the bigger of a bit animal he becomes. He becomes a wimp for love. Or when he discovers that he has been had, he's a slave of the demanding woman, he tries to rebel with violence, O.J. Simpson. Death, murder. See? So... Uh, but at least Adam had the choice, and we, because we, there are no fathers, even if a father is there, he isn't. He's a slave of her, and she's a slave of what you cannot see, of death. The relationship with men and women is death. It looks like life. It looks like you're going off into the sunrise. It's not when you get married. It's the sunset. And the answer to bad marriage is not no marriage, because the answer to not living properly isn't killing yourself is living properly. The answer to bad marriage is a good marriage, but what is good? We don't know the way anymore. Religion is supposed to give us the way, but it's lost the way itself. The blind leads the blind. Christian scripture is right on the money, and I'm Jewish. I'm still Jewish, but Christian scripture, its interpretation of the fall of man and the need for salvation from the fall, the choice called original sin, which comes down to us from generation to generation, is that what I've explained before is that uh, Adam and Eve, or the uh, story of uh, Romeo and Juliet, is a script. And every human being that steps on the stage of life is born 
um, is, plays out this role. The, their, their life is scripted. The same lines, they play the same lines exactly. If you look at the man and woman history throughout the centuries, the same Roman, he comes home drunk, he, he runs around with other women, he beats up the kids, he's, see? It's the same story and the same reasons behind it. The more a woman supports a male ego, the bigger animal he becomes. The more satisfaction you give him, the more dissatisfied he becomes. Same with a spoiled child. You give in to a spoiled child, he cries louder. See? He, what he needs is correction, but men don't know about correction. They don't know about, about true love. They only have a hunger for women. And women need the love that men, have, men cannot have fallen. They have seduced, in their life, they seduced men from the very love that inner self. They seduce men from the very love they, they, that could be given them. They're actually, men fall from love when they fall in love. They fall into slavery. And so it doesn't need to be this way. I want to make, want to make it perfectly clear. I'll make it perfectly clear. <laughs> that it doesn't need to be this way. And I'm not against women or anything. I'm just saying that's, I'm stating the fact. And so you asked the question about, well, in, in, in the Quran that they, they believe that Jesus was a prophet and not a, a, a messiah. Not the Christ. Not the Christ. And uh, there has to be a Christ. Whether there was a Christ came or will come, there has to be one because the seed of man is corrupted. Your father, bless him, God rest his soul, um, was a victim of your mother. He, he, was, he was almost like a son. You know, um, he has, has suffered the same inheritance, being born subject to women, going back to women, and missing the return cycle of where he'd fallen from. The man has two origins, from a woman and also from the Creator, the firstborn, the firstborn man, the son of man, son of woman. See that? Son of God, son of woman. Adam was the son of God, basically, but he fell in, in fell procreating. See that? What would you think, what do you think the, um, the he saw he was naked, what did that mean? Is that the fallen nature, uh, the death of the man, the dying, the separation from God to be God, awakens the reproductive instinct. He saw he was naked and they put on loincloths. With the sin comes a sex drive, an, an inordinate sex drive. See, ego, can it, I call it egotistical. <laughs> see, exactly right. Men are egotistical creatures, you see. And they don't understand that they're connected. And the more you gratify the ego testicle, the more ego and the more testicle, you see. And so this drives a woman up the wall, and she doesn't understand herself. She needs a, a spiritual love, like, don't look, Eve, put that fruit down. Don't support my ego. I don't need your support. Thank you. I love you. I love you for... See, the love, it's a protective love, not a supportive love for ego. See, so any if anytime you support someone's ego, you make them into monsters. You make them into tyrants, you see. They shouldn't have an ego that needs supporting. That's death and dying for both men and women, you see. And so, uh, we, every man that's born of woman had never had a father to love the mother, to love the hell out of her. The father has always loved the hell in her for the support that he needed, see. So he wasn't there. So the next generation of men and women are born the same way, subject to the influence of the female with no fathers. Look at today's society. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at today's society and see uh, in the inner cities that 83% of all the criminals in jail had uh, come from single parent homes headed by a mother. The other 17% there, the father was there, but he wasn't there. He was there only in a body. You see that? He had a violent father or a dominant mother. A violent father is only trying to overcome the female dominance in an in a animal way, not a spiritual way, you see. So you have an O.J. Simpson situation, see? either a wimp or an animal. So this is death for the human race. Well, the human race is looking for salvation. Salvation from that fallen state. And, and as this Christian scripture correctly points out, it is a salvation by faith. Because what was the, what was the fall all about? It was not believing if you should eat that fruit, you shall surely die. 
And the serpent says, you won't die, you'll live forever. It was a lie. So it's simply not believing. For instance, if I'm your friend and someone comes along and says, you know, your friend's got AIDS and he's not really nice, and I believe him, I fall out of favor with you and, and I, I, I disbelieve you and I'm believing this enemy. And now the enemy is my friend and you are my enemy. Who, are, who is my real friend? So same with your conscience. Your conscience looks like your enemy, you see? And the trouble is we're born into this world where our mind is fixated to all, everything that's wrong through the failing of your father, through, the, through your mother, through the failing of your father to love mother properly, to love the hell out of her, but he loves the hell in her because what use is a woman if she doesn't have a little hell in her, right? Support it, <laughs> right? You know? So this is the problem with the human race and the reason why you need a messiah one that's not born of the seed of Adam to save you is because the seed of man is tainted. You see, there are all, we're all born animals from animal parents. And, uh, but some of us have a longing. We know there's something wrong with our conditioning, the way we're born and the way we're dying. And we can also see the way our lives are going and our collectively see, we see the way the, the um, society is going. And we don't like it, but we, we're looking for something. And religion rushes in but it gives us verses and chapters and makes us little machine kids, you know, which is like little wind-up toys of spouting verses and chapters. And even though it's truth in it, a lot of truth in many religions, they lead us with the truth, not to it. You see, there's another subtlety. Because if you look at the problem of the original sin, basically we have two modes of op operating. The, the, the wordless word in our hearts, we know we don't know why we know. The, the, la the word, language word which seduces us. We are seduced by language words from the wordless word and therefore we're locked into believing it. We, it causes us to doubt ourselves. That's our sickness. And now comes along religion. Sing songs, boogie woogie down, down the aisle. All kinds of snake handling and excitements. These excitements are not religion but it gives you a religious excitement but there's no different from drug excitement. What, it, they call it religious experience, but it's religious excitement. There's a religious experience, but in order to have religious experience, you have to set aside religious excitement. It only comes in the calmness, because in the, in the silence, in the calmness, we meet our maker. But in the excitement, we run from him. We find a new life, the death of the ego. So there's a, there's a kind of death of the ego that leads to real life. But there's a scripture that says something beautiful about that too. It says, who shall preserve his, I shall amplify it. Who shall preserve his ego animal life shall lose the spiritual life. The words in, in Greek, two words for life. If I'm not, I may not pronounce them properly. Suche and zoe. Zoe is, is animal life. Suche is spiritual life. We only have one word, so we don't understand what he's saying. Who shall lay down his ego animal life, the excitement of ego, that keeps you the animal, the ego animal, thinking that you're going to live forever with each burst of excitement, denying death. He, you lay down that life or you preserve that life, and if you preserve it, you will not find the spiritual. And so, to cut a long story short, we need to be saved from, from, from a choice. We don't have, we've never made that choice yet. We were just born to animal parents and we're born to the conditionings of our society and the pressures, the peer pressures, and we're molded by it. And some of us are happy with it. We're good little robots and true to the state. Some of us are not satisfied with that. And we seek and we find. And we find there's a plan prepared for those that love the Creator. And there is a, a plan for salvation. Now the plan for salvation is very simple. It needs to reverse the doubt. We need to, in other words, salvation comes by faith. And what is it? You have to have something to have faith in. Can you have faith in a rabbi? Can you have faith, faith in a shaman? Can you have faith in a, 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 a preacher? He's only gone to school and he's, he pontificates and, and presides over s dead rituals, legalism. It, to me, he's dead. They don't point the way to life within. So there has to be 
a bridge. And it can't be an ordinary man. So we need an, an, a man that is not ordinary. How is he not ordinary? He's born of a virgin. What I'm saying is that the Savior, the Messiah, can't be an ordinary man. He can't be born of the lineage because it's all doomed. He, he has to be born with an allegiance intact to his Creator, be tested again and not fail. And so that an interesting thing, if you could ever meet a Messiah person face to face, you could see he's coming from a different place. We, in our colloquialisms, we use like, I see where he's coming from, you see? Human beings aren't just, not just flesh, but they have an allegiance either to good or not, to, not so good. And he had, we, we can be good as our fallen nature will permit, as long as we're regimented by rules and regulations and dead legalism, but it's not enough for me. That will do for the time being, that keeps us civilized and not killing each other, you see? The roles of the heart work well as, as social order, see, uh, imposed upon us from, by stones, you know, by being inscribed upon stone, laws we call them, right? But we have to be restored to that fallen state, and, but we're, not, we're born separated from it. And, and the, the secret is to be restored by what? By faith. Adam believed a lie, and the, the, and the language the, 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 um, the, the words that come by language are different from the words that are wordless in the heart. There's the wordless word and there's the language word which you hear with your ears, see? And we're all controlled by language, rhetoric, confused totally. Even when we're led by truth, we're, even, if the, even if it's true what they're saying, and it runs parallel to what truth is what we should eventually understand. We cannot really deeply understand it because, because we, are, um, we are captured by language and controlled by it. We need to rise above language and not have the faith that comes from following people who tell us how to live and what's right and what's wrong. There's a natural rebellion against that, even if it's right. What we need to be is being restored to the original state from which the first man has fallen, and that's life. And that can only come by faith. But you can only have faith in a person who has language, because language is what we know, but language must be loaded with someone who is, is loaded with, 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 with original life. And what I mean by that is you can only believe somebody, language, who is believable. If your son is in an accident, and someone who's not believable comes along and says, oh, your son's all right. You're not very cheered by that, see? Even though it's true, <laughs> your son's all right. But somebody you know well and is trustworthy he says, your son's all right, it relieves you. There's the magic there. And so if someone is truly believable and someone it comes from, is born of a virgin and is, is linked to that other dimension and he says to you, I'm the son of God and everyone who believes that God has sent me and, and has brought me to reconcile the human race, those who believe in me, reconcile him to God again, will be saved. Simple. God announces to the human race that here is my son, here's a person you can see, touch and feel. You, you've never been able to see me before, but now you see me in him. And he is, has my nature in him, and he carries this message. Believe that he has come from me, number one, and if he's believable, you should believe it. It's a simple, a reversal of the original sin. Second, my father says, you're forgiven if you repent of your pride, because pride came from original sin, right? Sprung up from that. Believe, repent of your sin, and believe that God is forgiven, and you'll be reconciled through my son. What more could you want from that? If it's, that's the whole key. And so Christians are correct when they say that salvation is by uh, faith. But how has faith come? Someone to have faith in. Now, where is he today? He's in my heart. I read about him in the scripture. Ah, that's who's been following me all my life. <laughs> Simple. It's strange enough, when you live together and you grow together, let's say you have, you're growing to, your husband and wife and you've grown together, and you've not loved each other properly, you'll grow together, and you're like barnacles, stuck to each other. 
You don't live with each other, you live from each other. So when the other person dies, I think this is what you're looking for. You resent the death of the other person. You actually, you may not believe what I'm saying right now, but it's a, it's a secret that people keep in their hearts and they won't admit it. They hate the person for dying. They hated them when they lived too. They have this love-hate relationship with them, see? And uh, you hate somebody, you feel guilty, and then you love them to make up for the guilt. And you live off their approval. And they take advantage of you. And then you hate them again. And you feel guilty. And then you feel guilty, you try to get them to love you, to take away the pain you feel. And you serve them, and you slave yourself to them, and they take advantage of that. Human nature does that. Now they die off you. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, you've left, you're left alone on this wretched earth. You, you've got approval from this person, and now your entourage, you, the person who's loved you or looked up to you and gave you a sense of worth is gone. And you're left alone with unfinished business, your conscience. You feel wretched. You feel betrayed by the death of this person. And so you can't get over the grieving because you can't get over the hating. If you hate somebody, you can't get him out of your mind. I was watching a movie the other night. Who was this fellow singing in the rain, remember? Gene Kelly. Yes, he was saying to his leading star, yes, he said, well, you were unkind to me the other day, but, um, and I did, was angry with you, very angry, but I could not get you out of my, your, my mind. You know. But that went past like the wind. When you're angry with someone, you cannot get them out of your mind. And you're angry with someone who died on you, you, you haven't got them to make up to. And so you're left with this terrible pain of guilt, remorse. You want to be with them. You almost identify. You've died with the, the person you live with and you identify with. You're identified with this person. You want to be with them. Because death is an escape from not living properly. See? You long for them. In their, in their death and wherever they are, you want to be with them because you want to be complete to them. This is sickness. So very few people can handle bereavement because they haven't lived with that, that person that died properly. And so when I talk to people and counsel them about these things, I talk to them about that and make them aware of their anger towards the, de the, the death of their spouse or whoever and how they mistreated them. And believe it or not, instead of being cruel, they actually find relief by facing the truth of the life they've lived. Yes, I was responsible for the death of my husband, my son. I did contribute to it by the way I treated him. I tried to get love from him and he rebelled and re went on drugs and, 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 and then he died and, and I see how selfish I was. And it, it was terribly painful, but then wonderfully relieving.